Hello, this is Cavalier in the morning. Good Cavalier to you. Today, part four of our series of the agonizing pain in which I live every day. The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, the bastard love child of David Starkey and Mary Whitehouse will continue his journey down into the abyss that is known as the Bad Tudor Drama, where I am sure nothing will go wrong. Since I'm getting sick of everything Philippa Gregory related, and have several months to prepare myself before the final season of The Spanish Princess is inflicted upon us, I thought it would be a good idea to go back a bit and look at a two-part miniseries from 2003 that has become rather infamous, that being the ITV production Henry VIII. This is a bit of a strange one, with some quite well-known actors and actresses, a decent-sized budget, and it was made by ITV, one of the main British television networks. Somehow, though, they gave us a miniseries that left many, including myself, rather baffled, with odd casting choices, unintentionally hilarious scenes, and some rather weird and unnecessary changes from the actual history. Now, this rant will be structured the same way I did Tudor Rant 3, with the exception of a brand new segment called Cock Up on the Filming Front, looking at what went wrong behind the scenes. I think it is absolutely necessary that I start with this little segment, since it will help establish just what the hell happened for this series to come into existence, which may also help explain its inaccuracies somewhat. And so, without any further ado, let us begin our look at 2003's Henry VIII. For my non-British viewers, I will begin by briefly explaining the situation regarding the major television networks here in the UK. Back in the 1950s, the British Broadcasting Corporation, or BBC for short, was granted the Royal Charter, giving it exclusive rights to broadcast television, which it still has to this day. However, very quickly, a rival network emerged called Independent Television, or ITV. Whilst people still have to pay money to the BBC to watch all live television, there was now at least a bit of competition, and these two networks have effectively become the cornerstone of British television, producing a number of dramas over the years. The BBC, for example, created the Six Wives series, Elizabeth R, and The Shadow of the Tower, which I have covered and mentioned in other videos. ITV, meanwhile, got in on the game by producing a lot of drama set in the Victorian Edwardian eras like Edward VII, Disraeli, and so on. Nowadays, there are a lot more channels out there, Channel 4 in particular being something of a third rival, but the BBC and ITV are in effect the main competitors when it comes to British-made dramas. After the 80s, historical-based productions were, for the most part, abandoned in favour of crime and soap dramas, although a few, like Sharp, would crop up from time to time. By early 2001, the BBC had suffered a series of bad ratings with its lineup, and so ITV, hoping to try and steal their thunder a bit, decided to commission some new dramas, including a miniseries about King Henry VIII, which was new territory for them since, up to that point, they had not really produced anything Tudor-related. Peter Travis would direct it, whilst Alan Bleasdale was hired as the writer for the miniseries. However, Andy Harries, controller of drama ITV, could allegedly only secure £750,000, which would not be anywhere near enough to produce the planned two one-and-a-half-hour episodes, and thus began nearly two years of painful pre-production. Harries approached the American CBS network for funding, but they said they would only fund the project if Sarah Michelle Gellar, who many of you will remember as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, was cast as Anne Boleyn, and the rest of the series be dubbed by American voice actors. Whilst the prospect of having prominent British actors like David Suchet and Sean Bean be dubbed over by Americans is rather funny, Harry's quite rightly turned down this offer. In the end, he was able to cobble together between £5.2 and £6 million from several other networks to fund the project, £1.3 million of which would go towards paying the star's salaries. However, a problem then emerged. Bleasdale had been writing his script, and planned to have the opening scene feature Henry VIII being dragged to hell and meeting the devil. Since this is the early 2000s, I can only imagine the horrifying CGI that we would have had to experience. However, it was not to pass. One day, Harry's was having a chat with Nick Elliott, ITV's drama commissioner, and he brought up the devil scene in the opening. According to Harry's, Nick just exploded. I'm not having the devil on ITV. You'd better ring him and tell him I'm not paying five million pounds to have the devil on ITV. Personally, I never knew ITV was such a Christian channel. 
<laughs> and just beat the devil out of it. Bleasdale was replaced by Peter Morgan, who has since gone on to write the screenplays for films and series such as The Queen, The Crown, and The Other Berlin Girl. Please keep that last one in mind. Finally, in early 2003, they filmed the series, the details of which I shall go over in the authenticity section. But even before it aired, ITV effectively signalled an albeit temporary defeat in the ratings war with the BBC by freezing their drama budget at £835 million, far below the £1 billion the BBC had put forward. Nevertheless, the miniseries was released in October of that year and managed to top the ratings with 8 million viewers for part 1 and 7.7 .7 for part 2, which meant they were just able to beat the BBC on those nights. It would somehow go on to win an International Emmy Award and even got nominated for Best Visual Effects by the Royal Television Society. However, the actual series we were given was a bit of a confusing, jarring mess, which we shall now look at in detail. Right after the opening credits, we get some problems which will, sadly, set the pattern for how the rest of this mini-series will play out. The first part opens with King Henry VII on his deathbed, advising his son, the soon-to-be King Henry VIII, on how to rule as king. Now I say Henry VII, but Joss Ackland here looks nothing like him. Not to mention that Ackland was about 75 at the time, when the real-life Henry VII was barely 52. It is not like he dramatically aged in his final years either, since his death mask survives and was used to make this sculpture, which is fairly consistent with previous portraits of him. In fact, he is one of the first kings we have firm evidence on as to his exact appearance. This is the only scene with Henry VII in it. How on earth did you mess up on casting a character who dies in the first two minutes? How much effort would it have taken to find an actor who could look somewhat like this? Also, I know he is dying, but I highly doubt that he would basically agree that, to be a good king, you need to make war with France. I will direct you to the previous Tudor rant and all his devious machinations in preventing wars and saving every penny possible. We will now go through the characters and look at how they are portrayed compared to their historical counterparts. And of course, we have to address the main reason why you're all here. Ray Winston as Henry VIII. Now, Winston is well known for playing gangster-style roles in his films, which he is well suited to, particularly since he has a very strong Cockney accent. Of all the actors that have been cast as Henry VIII, Winston has to be one of the most jarring because of that reason. Yes, I know people's accents back in the 16th century were different to now, but I highly doubt the royal-born and raised Henry, who often travelled from palace to palace, would be speaking like he owned a corner shop in the East End. I will say that his accent is not as strong as I remembered from the first time I saw this series many moons ago, and in some scenes it feels like he is trying to speak a bit like Richard Burton's portrayal of Henry. I was so anxious to see you, madam, I ran ahead. Have you been faithful to me or lying about with this husband of yours? <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him that uh, when I was a child I played nothing but checkers. Well, they would do what I say, I am their king. However, it is when he gets angry that the accent really comes out and honestly, I found it really funny. Some of these scenes are so over-the-top melodramatic that I feel like Baldrick was going to turn up with one of his cunning plans at any moment. And you slag! Get in the motor! Jay! Remedy what, man? They're signed and sealed! It was the answer to Holbein's body. If he had no, it painted... was your fault! A simple act of supremacy would merely restore things to their rightful place. Yes, Baldrick, let us not forget that you tried to solve the problem of your mother's low ceiling by cutting off her head. <laughs> Hell, the comedy does not stop there, I mean... <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, is this, is this meant to be a drama or a comedy sketch? Now, in terms of physical appearance, this version of Henry does actually somewhat look accurate, save for his height. Ray Winston is apparently 5 foot 8, whereas the real Henry was 6 foot 2, which, even by today's standards, is pretty tall, and meant that he literally towered over his court, where the average height of most men was 5 foot 7. Yet another pedantic point, I know, but Henry's height and physical presence is what made him stand out so much. This version of Henry does not stand out to me, and feels more like he has Napoleon Syndrome. Henry was a very well-educated prince. He could speak French, Latin, and Spanish fluently. He composed numerous songs, such as Pastime with Good Company, Helles Madame, and Envoyer Amour, just to name a few. He wrote poetry. He wrote books, including one titled Assertio Septum Sacramentorum, which, ironic considering what would happen several years later, defended the Catholic faith and earned Henry the title of Fide Defensor, or 
defender of the faith, which is still used by English and then British monarchs through to the present. Henry surrounded himself with learned and intellectual men such as Sir Thomas More, or as he is also called, Sir not appearing in this film. He may have evolved into a bloody tyrant and was even showing traits of that long before that, Buckingham's execution being one example, but one thing remained consistent. He was at the centre of the English Renaissance and ushered in a new wave of learning, of art, and made an impact on England in a way that very few others have done. Do you see the problem here? Ray Winston is just not right for the role. Hell, there are a few times when he does try, particularly with the love letters, but he just cannot portray the intellectual side of Henry at all. Henry was not just a man who went around chopping off people's heads like in horror films. He was a complicated man of many talents, and his transformation from a devout Catholic, loyal to Rome and, somewhat, to his wife, into a bloated tyrant who tore up centuries of tradition and laid the foundations of modern England, is a compelling one. That is what draws people to Henry, and why so many dramas have been made about him over the years. Making absurd casting choices such as the cockney-speaking Ray Winston, who was good at playing mobster bosses and gangsters, is not compelling in the slightest. My biggest gripe with this Henry, though, has to be what he does to Anne Boleyn in this scene. There's only one way to improve your position, and that's to give me a son! Don't forget, you need to be involved as well, or as head of the church, do you think you're now so close to God you can have immaculate conceptions too? <laughs> Let me move! Let me pleasure you! STAY STILL! Yep, they actually have Henry rape Anne. <sighs> now, of course, we don't have any evidence that Henry did not rape her, but then we also do not have any evidence that Henry was not an alien from the planet Zog. So you will excuse me if I dismiss the idea that Henry was a rapist out of hand completely. He was a tyrant. He got angry. He had mistresses. But as a king, he always tried to come across as a noble figure to those around him. The scene also feels so sudden and out of place. One second they're having a realistic argument about Henry having other mistresses, the next he just rapes her. Now, horrid things like killings, rapes, etc. can be shown in dramas, but it has to fit in and not be put there merely for the shock factor. It feels to me like they only put this in their show so they can make headlines to push their drama, and given the outcry at the time it aired, it certainly drummed up attention to their show. I personally find this a sickening way for a show to generate views, since it shows to me that the series they have written cannot stand on its own merits, so it has to forcibly generate controversy in order for it to stand out. I will point to some of the later dramas like The Tudors and Rain for being guilty of this as well. A few other inaccuracies of note with Henry. For some reason he is shown as fighting hand to hand with some of his retainers in a mock fight without armour. <sighs> Henry would not do this unless he were fully kitted out, considering that at this time period, Edward had not been born yet. If he died doing this, then the dynasty is screwed. Yes, he did joust quite a bit, but at least he wore armour. And remember, by 1536, he had retired from it due to his previous accidents. And then in his final scene, where he has a chat with Colin Creeper from Gryffindor, <coughs> sorry, his son, the soon to be King Edward VI, is also inaccurate, since Edward was in another palace. This also played into the Seymour's effective seizure of power after the King's death since they kept it a secret for a few days to allow them time to secure Edward. I know they wanted to do an ironic thing by having the first and second and last scenes be a mirror of each other, but you really miss out a golden opportunity to show the Seymour's plotting. Overall, as a comedic parody, this is a great version of Henry, but as an accurate portrayal, it is a terrible version of his character. I do feel a bit bad for laying into Ray Winston though, since he does seem like a generally nice fellow, and you can tell from interviews at the time that he was so happy to get cast in something a bit different, but I am sorry, but he's just not Henry. ITV, I know casting such an unusual choice for Henry may generate headlines, but that is not a good way to approach a drama series. And now, on to the wives. First up, we have Catherine of Aragon, portrayed by Sumter Cerner. Yet again, I will begin with my usual pedantic complaining about hair colour. Catherine is well known for having reddish hair, which is confirmed in contemporary portraits of her. I appreciate the fact that, for once, you actually got a Spanish actress for the role and not an English actress doing a bad Spanish accent. <coughs> but for God's sake, we know roughly what Catherine looked like. Stop doing this stereotypical casting and assuming that all Spanish people have olive skin dark hair. Well, on to her character. The main problem I feel is that she suffers from what many other Catherines suffer from, and that is the fact that a lot of the early part of her story is cut to drive forward to the Anne Boleyn stuff. We do not get to see her early romantic date with Henry, her ruling as regent in Henry's place when he was campaigning in France, and all of the miscarriages he had in her effort to have a son, although they do at least mention the latter. Catherine though feels a bit wasted in this. 
She has a few good scenes at the start, then she virtually disappears until just before the Legatine Court, and, yet again, disappears right after that until we finally get to her death. Well, this is art imitating life, I suppose. She was cast aside by the real Henry, and by this adaptation as well. Anne Boleyn, played by Helena Bonham Carter, is a bit of a walking contradiction of a character. We first meet her in 1524 when she is engaged to Henry Percy, the future Earl of Northumberland, but has to seek the king's approval, but is denied. <sighs> now, yes, Anne did have a relationship with Percy, but she was most certainly not engaged to him. In fact, at the time, her father was trying to have her married off to the Anglo-Irish Marcus Vormond in order to grow the Boleyn's influence in that area. So Wolsey forced Percy, who was under him, to end his relationship with Anne. Now, why on earth did they decide to change it like this? Well, they may be paying homage to a certain other Anne, but a bit more about that and other homages a bit later on. Anne, though, just feels so weird in this one. I know the real-life Anne Boleyn was a divisive figure, and views of her range from that of a martyr, sacrificed by her powerful family, to a scheming vindictive whore who drove the king from the true faith, with very little nuance in between. But still, I wish we had some consistency with her in this. She starts off being very reluctant to be with the king, and denies his advances. Okay, so far so good. And then, I don't know, suddenly she's scheming and fully on board with the coming queen. Oh wait, no, no, back to reluctant. Oh no, no, sorry, she's vindictive again. And finally back to martyr. And the thing is, most of the first part is focused on Anne, and even then it is just on her rise and a bit of her downfall. We get very little of what she did as Queen, how she fell out with her hitherto reliable ally Thomas Cromwell over the monasteries and foreign policy, and only the bare bones outline of what caused her downfall. At least it did get a few points in there, so I can't say this is the worst Anne, but it is a long way off from the best, that is for sure. Now as to the choice of actress. For Anne, I'm at a loss for words. She's an okay actress when given a good role, and my condolences for yet again getting cast as a queen in Tudor England who gets her head chopped off, but I don't think she is Anne. Whilst we don't have any firm surviving portraits of Anne, save for a very damaged medallion, we do know that she was slender, had seductive appeal, and was a highly intelligent woman, who, with her education at the French court, really stood out. The series does try to reference this, but it just doesn't seem to go far enough. Even Dorothy Tutin in the 1970s series, who also does not quite resemble Anne, at least got her personality and temperament down well. I did not feel like I was watching Anne Boleyn with this series, and, coupled with Cockney King Hal in his pub over here, it was like watching a bad Christmas special of EastEnders at times. But I cannot really blame Helen Bonham Carter for that, and I firmly laid the blame at the feet of the writers for hacking up characters worse than the man being hung, drawn and quartered. But, again, we will get to that point later. Jane Seymour is played in this series by Amelia Fox, and was quite a bit more cunning, I felt, compared to other portrayals of her. Now, the real-life Jane Seymour is a bit of a mystery. She seems to have come from virtually nowhere to Queen in a short space of time. She was initially laid in waiting under Catherine of Aragon, and we do actually see this in one scene, although she is just kind of... there. And they never mentioned her being a lady in waiting to Catherine at all, so... well, moving on. Her meteoric rise to power surprised pretty much everyone. Even the well-informed Imperial Ambassador, Yusuf Chapuy, seemed completely baffled as to where she came from and how she'd been able to capture the King's heart. This version doesn't really go into her rise too much. In fact, it felt very rushed, since they had spent so long on Anne Boleyn. It was almost like they were pressed for time and so rushed ahead. As for her reign, they do at least get the basics right, namely her support for bringing Henry's daughter, Mary, back to court, and her sympathies for the pilgrimage of grace, and Catholicism in general. So I can't fault them for that even though the real Jane was probably more close to how she was portrayed in the 1970 series, as opposed to this one. That does not prevent us, though, from getting some pretty bad scenes, though, including the second worst scene in the whole thing, the one where Henry, in a rage, assaults the heavily pregnant Jane, who then goes into premature labour. This scene, pretty much like the rape scene, did not happen, and I can prove this one scientifically. This scene is meant to take place just after the execution of Robert Ask, which was in July 1537. Jane, meanwhile, did not give birth to Edward until October, three months later. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the Tudors copy this as well? Seriously, it feels like a lot of the later bad Tudor dramas decided to use this film for their research. Well, at least Jane's death did give us this unintentionally hilarious moment from Henry. Jane! Jane! I would do a bit on Anna Cleves here, but she's barely in this. Hell, does she even have any dialogue? Then again, he wasn't married to her for too long, so I can somewhat understand this. Moving on, we will now address the character of Catherine Howard, Henry's fifth wife, played by Emily Blunt, who was a virtually unknown actress at the time. One nitpick I must point out is her hair colour. 
Historically, Catherine had reddish brown hair, as can be seen by this Holbein miniature, which is almost certainly a contemporary image of her. However, Emily Blunt is blonde in this, which baffles me all the more since her hair colour is naturally brown. Did she dye it for this role, or did she get cast and dye it before filming? It seems such an odd thing to do, since if she'd kept the brown hair, she probably would have not been too bad of a match. Yes, this is a nitpick, but then I will redirect you to my other rant videos. Catherine's character in this, though, is, yet again, a weird mishmash of other portrayals of Catherine Howard, which I will go into a bit in the How It Stands as a Drama section. But in this, she is flirting and scheming one second, then an innocent victim the next, leaving us rather confused as to whether we should be feeling sorry for her or not. I mean, yes, you can have characters do questionable things and still be sympathetic, but it has to be done in a coherent fashion. Her affair with Francis Derham is only brought up briefly, and, by the way, he was in Ireland by 1540, so would not be with her in this scene, and the affair with Culpepper is framed as her doing, egged on by Norfolk of all people. Now, some details are sketchy, but Catherine was adamant that she did not have an affair with him, and to be honest, the evidence itself is rather sketchy and contradictory on all sides. I would recommend Connor Byrne's book on the subject, which goes into it a bit more, but from what I can ascertain, Culpepper was the one who approached Catherine, and Lady Roch would help facilitate their meetings. Catherine was rather annoyed at him trying to get close to her. It is doubtful they slept together, and even historians like David Starkey seem to support this view. In the series, though, they make out that she is sleeping with him so she can have a son, since Henry is infertile. Now, at least this plot point isn't too out of the realms of possibility, but it is highly unlikely, and her cunning and political savvy uncle Norfolk would not be advising her to do something so dangerous, since siring a bastard child is high treason. Catherine might do that, Norfolk would definitely not encourage it. Catherine's worst portrayed scene, though, has to be her death, where, while she does give a somewhat accurate final speech, she then has a complete mental breakdown, screams, I don't want to die, and has to be forced to be held down whilst the executioner cuts off her head. If the real-life Catherine did that, then someone would have mentioned it. Instead, Ambassador said that, while she appeared weak and frail, she gave a short speech and died well by Tudor standards. An actual eyewitness, Otwell Johnson, said that, for they made the most godly and Christian's end that was ever heard tell of, I think, since the world's creation. According to our old friend Eustace Shukwi, the Imperial Ambassador, she spent the night before her execution practicing how to lay her head on the block so that she would get it right. I therefore would highly doubt that she would have had a mental breakdown like this after preparing herself so thoroughly and in light of eyewitness and contemporary testimony. I will therefore say that her having a mental breakdown is there purely to appease our old enemy, dramatic purposes. At this point, I would discuss Claire Holman's portrayal of Catherine Parr, but she is barely in this as well. Again, much like the 1972 film, she has virtually no significant scenes, other than one conversation with Henry interceding on behalf of her sister-in-law. We get a brief mention of her encouraging friendly relations between Henry and his children, absolutely nothing about Catherine acting as regent whilst Henry was off campaigning in France, and only the slightest hint at the religious troubles she faced during her time as Queen Consort. Poor Catherine Parr always seems to get left out of most Henry VIII dramas, sadly. Now, Henry had a number of important ministers and noblemen throughout his reign, and it would take me forever to go through every single one portrayed in these films, so I shall try and limit myself to four or five of the somewhat main ones we see in this series, starting with the Duke of Buckingham, played by Charles Dance. Viewers nowadays will recognise him as Tywin Lannister from Game of Thrones, amongst... um... other works. Honestly though, when watching his scenes, it felt like I was watching some sort of early Game of Thrones prequel, and then I had to remind myself that this series was made eight years before the first season of Thrones. Charles Dance is an amazing actor, and plays the scheming powerful Lord figure very well, and so I was left seething with rage at how little he does in this. Edward Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, was historically executed in 1521, on what were probably trumped up charges of treason. So why the series decided to make him evil and move the events to 1524 is beyond me. Side note here, may I point out the fact that he was executed in May? So why is there snow on the ground? There is no snow in other execution scenes, despite the fact Culpepper's happened in December and Catherine's happened in February. So why was it added here? Since his character dies early on though, that means he's barely in this, giving him no time to really develop, and what we are left with is not great either, sadly. My biggest gripe with Buckingham's betrayal is that they claim he was not only plotting against Henry, but actively launches a rebellion, telling his followers to... So go back to your estates, prepare your armies, and meet me outside London in three days. 
Of course, whenever I want to meet a friend, I always say to him, meet me outside of town. I could specify where, but then that would not be as fun. Suffice to say that the historical Buckingham never took up arms against Henry, and whilst debate rages, it is pretty clear that his downfall was caused by his enemies at court, most notably Wolsey. Naturally, his plan is foiled in a scene I will go into a bit more detail about in the next part, but that is effectively all his character does. One scene of him plotting, a brief fighting scene, a torture scene, and then his execution. What a waste of a talented actor. You had Charles Dance in this, and you chopped his head off. Also, whilst he was good as the scheming Duke character, he was way too old for the role. The historical Buckingham was 43, whilst Charles Dance was about 57. Meanwhile, you have Mark Strong as the Duke of Norfolk, who, whilst a good actor, which we'll get onto shortly, was only about 39 or 40, and playing a character who ranges in age from 51 to 74. Why on earth was this not swapped, with Charles Dance playing Norfolk and Mark Strong as Buckingham? Who decided to mess up the casting this much? As I mentioned, Mark Strong is a good actor, but he certainly feels too young to be playing Norfolk in this. It would make more sense if he was older, in that it would display more of his experience when it comes to politics and war. Remember, Norfolk had served with his father at Flodden, been on the Privy Council for years, and had been a very active courtier well before the series even begins. This version of him, though, is a bit of a novice, I fear, and he makes some mistakes that the old Duke would not have done. For example, he learns about Catherine Howard's relationship with Thomas Culpepper, and encourages her to keep seeing him in order to sire a son. This is something the Duke would not have done, since, if it were found out he had effectively encouraged treason in such an open way, then he would be done for. Historically, he was genuinely dumbfounded when the revelations about his niece were revealed, and, in typical Norfolk fashion, threw her under a bus, wrote a groveling letter to the king, and actually remained in his good books. He was certainly not imprisoned in the aftermath of the Catherine Howard situation, as shown here. It was the actions of his son, the Earl of Surrey, displaying the arms of King Edward the Confessor, that actually got him in trouble with the king, which was probably not helped by the fact that, in 1546, his enemies the Seymours had already cemented their power at court and with the king. David Suchet as Cardinal Wolsey was an interesting choice. Now, many of you will probably recognise him as Hercule Poirot, and whilst the series is not one of his best, he certainly did a decent job of portraying Wolsey, giving him a sort of fatherly vibe. Hell, he actually outright says so in one scene. I've protected you, looked after you as if you're my own son. A bit on the nose, but not too bad, and I did actually enjoy watching it when he was on screen. However, and this is a common complaint I do have with many portrayals of Wolsey, but yet again, we seem to skip over quite a few parts of his career. Since the series starts in 1524, We've missed out his rise to power, including his handling of the 1513 campaign, his foreign policy achievements, and the field of the cloth of gold, just to name but a few. Even within the time frame of this series, we gloss over events in favour of the Anne Boleyn storyline. For example, in 1525, Henry wanted to have another war with France, his previous campaign in 1513 being something of a debacle, as was his second attempt in 1523. To launch this new campaign, the king needed money, and where to get that from? Well, the peasants, of course. To do that, though, Parliament needed to be called and agreed to extra taxes, which they had granted pretty consistently to monarchs in the past. This Parliament, though, was not so happy with the prospect of yet another foreign adventure wasting money, and it was assumed they would not support it. Obstinate Parliaments refusing to raise money for the monarch would henceforth become a common trend, as our old friend King Charles I would find out all too well. Wolsey, though, came up with a cunning plan. He decided to crowdfund creating something called the Amicable Grant that would not require parliamentary approval. The name suggests that this was merely a thing you could chip into if you wanted. Honestly, no strings attached. In reality, it was basically a series of forced loans, in which the clergy would pay a third of their income over £10, and a quarter if under, whilst those who were not clergymen, earning over £50 a year, had to pay 3 shillings and 4 pence in the pound, and 2 shillings 8 pence for those under £50. Naturally, being forced to fund something against your will, and with Parliament not having a say, meant that it was not very popular, particularly when the Crown had already taken £250,000 from the people in its previous 1523 subsidy for the last campaign that had not been repaid, £250,000 being the equivalent of about £130 million today in terms of purchasing power. By the way, Woolsey wanted £800,000 for this new grant, or £416 million. 
mass riots ensued across the country, to the point that 10,000 men converged on the town of Lavenham in Suffolk to launch a rebellion. It was only stopped in the nick of time thanks to some loyal townsmen removing the ropes of the church bells, so that the signal for the rising could not be given. Eventually, the grant was abandoned completely, and this failure was arguably the beginning of Wolsey's downfall. It would have been nice to have a mention of this important event, particularly since they often mention Henry's desire for war with France, and would have gone well with Wolsey's story, but hey, I guess we can't have nice things. Now on to Thomas Cromwell, played by Danny Webb. His portrayal of Cromwell was fairly standard. He's initially shown as a servant of Cardinal Wolsey, who ditches his old master in favour of the king in order to gain some more power, becoming the king's new right-hand man and serving as a lackey of him, getting rid of his enemies at every opportunity. Unfortunately, the Anne of Cleves marriage, which he arranged, was his undoing, and the king retaliates by having him executed. Overall, I can't say too much was wrong with his betrayal, given what was known at the time this production was made. It makes sense to show him as a schemer, although most of his schemes are related to Henry and his marital troubles, with only the briefest glimpses at his other political works, like the Act of Supremacy, his various alliance schemes, and the dissolution of the monasteries. Overall, a fairly average Cromwell. Not someone I'd rank highly, but certainly not bad. If I had to find one main error with his story, it would be the fact that, in this series, he's arrested in 1536 by the king as a way to appease Ask and his rebels, which did not happen at all. Whilst the removal of the king's advisers was one of their demands, Henry did not go so far in his trickery as to arrest one of his own ministers in order to appease Ask, albeit temporarily. That said, Danny Webb is a decent actor, and portrayed the devious and plotting side of Cromwell pretty well, although Wolf Morris, closely followed by Mark Rylance, would have to be my top two choices for portrayals of Cromwell. Can I just say though, you missed a golden opportunity for some drama with his downfall. In real life, when he was arrested, he was in an actual meeting of the Privy Council, and when he was taken away, the members started slamming their fists on the table shouting traitor as he was led away, exactly as it is portrayed in the 1972 film. Here, though, he kind of just sits there and waits to be arrested? Really? You're presented with free tickets on a silver platter to one of the finest establishments around. And instead, you went with, nah, let's go down the local chippy. Oh yes, and can I also point out that he was made Earl of Essex in 1540, and Boleyn's father was never given that title. At least Cromwell's execution scene has some truth to it, although the account of it taking more than one blow to remove his head does come from Hall's Chronicle, which was a bit later and is not mentioned by contemporary sources. However, there is no mention of the king deliberately hiring a novice executioner. That is spiteful, even for Henry. A side note yet again, Cromwell was executed on the 28th of July 1540, the same day Henry married Catherine Howard. So why does this series show him being executed before she's even brought to court? She would have been appointed as a lady-in-waiting in advance of the arrival of Anne of Cleves in early 1540, and the king apparently took an immediate liking to Catherine when he first saw her, not long after this, which may have helped in further scuppering the marriage with Anne, and thus Cromwell's career. This is something that could have easily been fixed, so why was it not done so? And of course, how could we forget Sean Bean's portrayal of Robert Ask? And since Sean Bean is playing him, you know he will have a long, happy, and prosperous life. Oh, oh dear. Well, at least he dies quickly. Paul's unconscious, make sure you wake him. All his death to last a full three days. Oh dear. Well, better luck next time, Sean. Now, the historical Ask was the younger son of a knight, and he decided to go into law. When the rebellion started, Ask was not actually a participant, but was travelling back from London at the time, only joining later, and then, probably due to his skills as a lawyer, became a leading figure in the rebellion. Remember as well that there were all these other people who were all prominent in the uprising, but are basically not mentioned in this at all. This Ask, though, is a former lieutenant in the King's army. Why? Why did you make him a soldier? That detracts greatly from his more humble origins. What was the point of that, other than to add a scene where he reminisces with Henry about the 1513 campaign? Also, the historical Ask and the rebels, whilst angry at the king's reforms, did not direct their anger towards the king's person, but towards his advisers. Ask himself put out a proclamation telling the men under his command to be true to the king's issue and the noble blood. In all their actions, the rebels claim to be acting in the king's best wishes. For example, the town of Beverley sent this message to the commons of Lincolnshire. 
We, the commons of Beverly, Yorkshire, are risen and sworn to God, our prince, and the commons against councillors, inventors, and procurers to undo both church and commons. Hell, this attitude was true throughout most of English history. When the English Civil War broke out in the 17th century, there was little thought of actually killing the king at first, and some parliamentarians had banners that read, For God, King, and Parliament. This ask, though, is more radical than Oliver Cromwell post-1649, it seems. Go home and rouse everyone you know. March against a king who is hell-bent on ruining this God-fearing land. I am your king. Only as long as I allow you to live. This is another one of those things they changed for dramatic purposes yet again. And in doing so, they destroyed the rather interesting historical character. And one of the largest Tudor rebellions was thrown by the wayside, when there was more than enough dramatic events here to portray. Crikey, even the Tudors portrayed the Pilgrimage of Grace in a much better way from what I remember. Well, at least the real-life Ask has a proper memorial to commemorate, or he just has a blue plaque where he was executed, and a park bench in the village of Swainby in North Yorkshire. Yet again, I know that Game of Thrones came out several years after this, but with Sean Bean getting arrested like this and dying a horrible death on top of Charles Dance playing a scheme nobleman, as I previously said, I honestly would have thought this was some sort of rip-off of Game of Thrones. Ah well, I guess G.R.R. Martin did have Cockney King Hal in mind when he wrote the books. I've pretty much covered the major plot points in the character summaries, so we'll not elaborate on it too much more in this section but I will give a brief summary of how I feel the events were portrayed overall. Whilst it does follow the chronology correctly, somewhat, I feel like that it was a waste of time starting with the Buckingham plotline, since they barely introduced any of the major players involved, and by 25 minutes in, it is all over. After that, it does suffer from the illness that plagues Tudor dramas, that can be diagnosed with these following symptoms. 1 glossing over or ignoring the first few decades of the king's reign, and relegating Catherine of Aragon to a supporting character. 2. Focusing on Anne Boleyn and Henry's relationship, whilst glossing over the Reformation to focus on their love life. And 3. Cramming the last four wives into the rest of the series, with Catherine Parr getting screwed over as much as Catherine of Aragon. Even the best Tudor dramas suffered from this to some extent, but it felt really pronounced here. At this point, I genuinely think you need something spanning several series to adequately cover this story, and whilst I do hate the Tudors series, they got the pacing down pretty well in spite of ignoring a lot of the early years, and starting with the Duke of Buckingham plot? Wait a minute. Uh, okay, just a coincidence, I'm sure. Whilst this series does somewhat show the events, I'll bite changing things like Buckingham actually having a rebellion, Henry raping Anne and beating up Jane, the latter of which was also in the Tudors. <laughs> Amongst other questionable changes, left me a bit baffled. There were a lot of plot points that felt so mashed together from other Tudor dramas that, well, we will address that soon. The series, much like its production and casting, was about as consistent with its authenticity as a high practice toddler is with what it wants. We will first have a look at the costumes and other associated accoutrements. I must say that, for the most part, Henry's costumes were not too bad, actually. They do look somewhat Tudor. Well, most of the time. And hell, he even has a codpiece of sorts. Well done. However, he is lacking a hat in most of his scenes, which is something that was a must for any Tudor gentleman, and the king especially, particularly if he was off riding or hunting, which this version of Henry does quite a bit. The outfits worn by the religious figures like Wolsey and Cranmer are also pretty well done, but then again, since that type of outfit is still worn today by many clergymen, they really could not go wrong with that. The rest of the gentlemen of the court, though, are a bit of an odd mixture. Cromwell, on the one hand, has the correct looking hat and fur lined cloaks, which are based off of the portraits we have of him. On the other hand, you get someone like the Duke of Norfolk, who looks like he's about to go off and join Sir Francis Drake for a quick raid on the Spanish treasure fleet several decades in the future. The guards, though, have to be the worst. Remember that this is what the yeoman of the guard should look like during the course of these films, yet they go for the conquistador style looking black leather combo. I mean, come on now. Even the Tudors got the guards' uniforms correct. It's not that hard, seeing as though the unit that guarded the king, the yeoman of the guard, still exists to this day, and wears a similar uniform to that worn back in Tudor times. 
Following on from that, the weird Buckingham Rebellion scene, other than being historically inaccurate in terms of the story, also makes no sense with its authenticity. The longbow was still very prevalent in England's armies, so why do the men all use crossbows? Yes, some men may have used them, but the longbow was one of Henry's favourites, confirmed by the many longbows that were found on the wreck of the Mary Rose. The way they all dress as well looks more medieval than Tudor. I mean, Henry here looks more like his ancestor Henry V, whilst Buckingham, wearing the wrong coat of arms, mind you, looks like he's just returned from fighting William Wallace. In reality, this period would see men of high rank wearing fine suits of armour, many of which survive in the Tower of London, whilst the men preferred tunics and hats, with some helms, whilst the billhook and the longbow remain the go-to weapons in the English arsenal, with the odd pikemen here and there. Outfits were baggy, colourful, and would look great on screen. So why the hell do dramas persist in giving us 13th century knights and or black leather clad, dull and generic foot soldiers? Still, we have this weird thing where a lot of the random extras in the background of the court scenes have somewhat decent and accurate costumes, whereas the main characters generally do not. Methinks ITV probably borrowed or found some for the extras from prior productions, which were more accurate, and then designed new ones for the actors and caught a bit of the old Alexandra Burnitis. Well, at least it did not evolve into denim virus. I think the women's clothing has to be the most schizophrenic though. During this historical time period, women usually wore a hood or hat of some sort to cover their hair for reasons of modesty and possibly hygiene. The gable or English hood was very popular during Henry's reign, but from the 1520s onwards gave way to the French hood, and much later on, we see women wearing hats as well. The style of hood a woman would wear could also be seen as something of a political statement. For example, both Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard wore the latest French fashion in order to stand out at court and to impress the king. Anne was also very pro-French, having been at the French court for some years. Meanwhile, Jane Seymour wore the older gable hood as a sign that she was different from her predecessor Anne Boleyn, and forced her ladies-in-waiting to adopt the older style as well, to show how she was a traditional English queen. This goes completely out of the window with this series though. Jane Seymour wears a French hood for most of her scenes, which is contrary to her traditional character. Anne sometimes wears a sort of French hood thing, but leaves her hair down, and sometimes doesn't even wear a hood at all, which a woman would not do, as previously mentioned. Catherine Howard, though, seems to be the hardest done by, since she does not wear a single hood in this, and is often stuck in what looks like clothing you'd wear to bed, not to walk around in during the daytime, and certainly not something you would wear to an execution in the middle of February. There is a reason why King Charles I asked for a second shirt to wear at his execution. Catherine of Aragon, though, wears... this... thing. Seriously, are you trying to make her look like a stereotypical Spaniard? I can't blame them for this too much though, since, save for the 1970 and 72 portrayals, she's pretty much always portrayed as a dark-haired, olive-skinned Spaniard with black and red dresses and Spanish-looking hats. Could have been worse though, I suppose. It is a good thing though that this production team decided to put time and effort into supporting Britain's tea and underpants industry by dipping the king's underwear in tea before a sex scene in order to make them look weathered. <sighs> Yes, I know staining things with tea is a good way to make things look warm. The problem is, though, is that the king was the most important person in the kingdom, so you bet your pumpkin breeches he would have an army of servants to clean and or make undergarments for him. Not to mention that I did not see a single scene where he was wearing them, so what was the point of that? Hell, what sort of perverse things is he up to where his pants have to be that colour? The style of language used in these films does have to be one of its worst elements. The makers of this, when writing their script, decided it would be best not to have any cold Tudor language, by which they mean, let us ignore the style of language used and instead have them speaking like they were in a soap drama. Now remember, Henry VIII was one of the most learned men in all Christendom. Meanwhile, what do we get in this series? Well... Stop it! Stop it! I can hardly hear myself think! I cannot have you both in such disagreement! Who's this one? Some pear-shaped trollop from the provinces, no doubt. What have you done? We will have an army of sons. Come here. Be a woman to your man. The queen promised me. She promised me sons. She has betrayed me. Get rid of her. Hey, this got some laughs out of me. And his romantic words such as come and be a woman to your man and she is going to give me an army of sons really work well as great pickup lines. I can tell you. Did I mention I'm single by the way? 
An unless anime waifus count, I suppose. The way prisoners of noble birth are treated in this miniseries is all wrong as well. We see the Duke of Buckingham strung up in chains and being tortured, the Duke of Norfolk rudely thrown into a cell, and Catherine Howard manhandled out of her apartments and presumably taken straight to the tower. This sort of thing annoys me since, during this time period, even a noble who was accused of treason would still at least be accorded some respect. Torture was not allowed on high-ranking people. Granted, they would be interrogated and pressured, no doubt, but physical torture was out of the question. Can I yet again repeat, poor Charles Dance. Rest now, you are too good for this world. They also always like to portray people being imprisoned in the tower, as though they have been flung in a jail cell or the corner of some dark dungeon. Now, contrary to popular opinion, the Tower of London was not primarily a prison. It was a royal residence, fortress, and its apartments, whilst not luxurious, were certainly a damn sight better than this. Anne Boleyn, for example, was housed in the Queen's apartments before her execution, a series of buildings constructed specifically for her back when she was crowned Queen, and would have looked pretty good by the standards of the time. Catherine Howard was presumably also housed here when she was waiting for her execution, not in the Tudor version of Dartmoor Prison. On the topic of sets, they were generally inaccurate in this. The bulk of them were, yet again, made it look like they were set in dull grey stone castles. Unlike some of the other Tudor dramas I've criticised though, these ones are really dark. I mean, look at this. It is nearly pitch black. Do you not have some torches or fireplaces or something to light the place up a bit? Well, other than the ones carried by the guards, who were always marching around in the constant loop, it seems. George Berlin, I arrest you in the name of the king. By the 1520s, Henry had embarked on an expensive construction programme, building many residences in the newer red Tudor brick, with wood panelled interiors, elaborate tapestries, and other elegant and extravagant accoutrements attached. You only have to visit Hampton Court Palace, built by Cardinal Wolsey, to get an impression of the style of the times. Even the interiors of older residences, like Windsor, would have been modernised and made more homely. This does seem to be a common trope with Tudor dramas to make them grey and like a stereotypical medieval movie, which is all wrong. That said, they did add one new thing to the list of inaccuracies. These... things. What the hell are these? These look like something I would see in the house of a Spanish nobleman. Why does Henry have these all over the place? I know Catherine of Aragon was Spanish, but she seems to have very much adopted the lifestyle of her new home, and by the 1520s was certainly an English queen through and through. Please stop trying to make Catherine into something she was not. Also, if somebody could find this flag for me, I would be very grateful, since I haven't the faintest idea what it stands for. This was the main standard carried by the men who supported the Pilgrimage of Grace, and whilst I would have to look into it in more detail, I'd imagine some variant of the Cross of St George would be carried. What are these random lines meant to represent, other than an A-level student's art project? Remember, the pilgrimage was a mainly religious rebellion, and the old Catholic symbols were a major rallying point for them. Why not show this a bit more with their standards? In terms of authenticity then, whilst it is not the worst, and there were a few bits here and there where they somewhat tried, you can clearly see that this production was a bit slash dash happy with how it approached the period. I think this is a great shame really, since, much like with the characters and the story in the last section, if they had just taken their time, researched and made some better costumes, found some better sets, or perhaps filmed on location a bit more, as opposed to some sound stages at Pinewood Studios, and also made the language a bit more period appropriate, then this series could have at least had that running for it. I know budget is a concern, but I will always bring up the 1970 series as an example of what you can do with authenticity on a tight budget. I must say that this one wasn't as bad as I remembered it. Possibly that is because I have subjected myself to the absolute worst Tudor dramas for so long that I will take anything that is even slightly better and enjoy it. Even so, this one did have some pretty big flaws. The series does have one thing going for it, and that is that it had some well-known actors. You have Ray Winston, Helena Bonham Carter, David Suchet, Charles Dance, Sean Bean, and at the time almost unknown Emily Blunt, and quite a few others. 
At least you cannot doubt the acting most of the time, and it really did feel like they were trying their best. I may have moaned about Ray Winston, but you could tell he was giving it his all, and this does seem to be confirmed by the fact that in interviews, he said that this was his favourite role. However, while some like David Suchet were good, many of the other casting choices were just... weird. Charles Dance in a bit part, who was killed off in the first 25 minutes. Helena Bonham Carter in one of the most confusing portrayals of Anne Boleyn you will ever see. Mark Armstrong as Norfolk. And of course, the title character being played by like a mob boss, just to name a few. Again, ITV seems to have just gone for an odd cast of well-known-ish actors in order to try and drive up views, which is the exact opposite of what to do when casting a period drama. Back in ye old days, otherwise known as the 70s, they didn't care too much about popularity, but instead went with people who fitted their roles near perfectly. So you had people like Keith Michelle as Henry, Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth I, and James Maxwell as Henry VII. They acted and spoke as though they could feasibly be these people, which was greatly helped by the fact that the scriptwriters and people making those dramas back in those days made them because they wanted to. The ratings and viewing figures weren't their primary concern. Quality and passion for the time period was. Ah yes, but this series won awards, so a go it is good, is an argument I have seen some put forward for other related tutor dramas. I'm sorry, but no. A committee of people deciding which gongs to give out is not the final word in quality. I mean, Ray Winston was nominated for an international Emmy for his performance, and given what you have witnessed, would you really say it was a good Henry or, hell, a good performance overall? Entertaining perhaps in the same way Tommy Wiseau in The Room is entertaining, but not an award-winning performance. To me, it also felt like they simply cobbled together half of the script from a load of other Tudor dramas, producing a weird Frankenstein's monster of a screenplay. Of course, being based off of history, you were going to get some overlap. For example, Catherine of Aragon's speech to the Legantine court is taken from her actual words. However, there are some events which we don't have transcripts of this time period that this drama appears to have taken from other works. First example, where Henry scolds Anne after her miscarriage. Now, I cannot play the clip due to the BBC being the second worst company to deal with in regards to copyright, although I did manage to sneak some of it into the Anne Boleyn episode review, if wish to see some of this scene, so apologies for the following dramatic reenactment. But in the 1976 Wives series, the exchange goes like this. Our son was born dead. It was too soon, before my time. There can be no blame for that. Our son is dead. Henry then says no a few times and dismisses the servants from the room. When they are gone, Anne responds with this. God's will, your grace. Oh, I, uh, we have had bad luck, but it, it will change. You've had him dead, madam. I cannot weep for you, not now. Uh, we weeping and love are close. And I am empty. I hear one thing pounding in my brain. The great whore. You killed him. You killed my son. No, you killed my son. Our son. My son, you killed him. Now let us hear it in the 2003 version. My son was born dead. There was nothing I could do. Um, there's no blame in that. You have killed him. No. The Queen is with you, old witch. I witch in collusion with the Protestants to torment me. Exhibit B. In 1536, Henry VIII had a jousting accident, which, whilst it now looks like it was nowhere near as serious as previously thought, please see the Anne Boleyn Files, excellent video for more info on that, it was assumed by many at the time that, that this series was made to have been a major turning point for Henry. However, the 1972 film, Henry VIII and his Six Wives, got it a bit wrong by showing him having a riding accident with the Duke of Suffolk, not a jousting accident. Guess how the 2003 version portrays it, in spite of the fact that they had a jousting set already built. <laughs> and finally, may the third eyewitness please take the stand. In the 1969 film, Anne of the Thousand Days, Henry VIII is shown as being present at Anne's trial, and later offers her a pardon if she agrees to an Anne annulment. But she refuses on the grounds that Elizabeth would be made a bastard. This, of course, did not happen. And Henry had the marriage annulled before Anne's execution anyway. However, the 2003 version pretty much follows this line as well. There are several more examples I could mention, particularly with other plot points from the 1970 series. But if one of these writers came to me today and said they did not take their inspiration from these earlier films and series, I would have to doubt them on that one. A quick side note, Peter Morgan, the writer, later went on to write the screenplay for The Other Berlin Girl, 
And some scenes, like Catherine confronting Anne before the Legatine court scene, are eerily similar. Again, I won't play them in full due to copyright concerns, but go and watch the scenes and compare them if you do not believe me. This seems to have directly impacted the series because it often felt like the characters were an amalgamation of previous portrayals of these people. Emily Blunt as Catherine Howard, for example. One moment, she is sly and devious, like the Angela Pleasant portrayal in the 1970 production. The next scene, she is an innocent victim, like Lynn Frederick's version of Catherine in the 1972 film. Anne as well flip-flops from Anne of the Thousand Days, 1970 Six Wives, and 1972 Six Wives constantly. I know you often have conflicting views on these people, particularly with someone like Anne, but it makes more sense to give them a coherent character and stick with it, not a conglomerate of several. With Wolf Hall, I could complain about how Anne in that is a bit negatively portrayed, but at least they were consistent and stuck with it, and were even able to work in some more sympathetic moments in there at the right time. Moving on, may I also humbly point out that the soundtrack in this, much like the script, sounds like it was also inspired by other works. Here are just a few examples which, again, due to copyright, will mean I'll have to just play the clips from the Henry VIII film and leak you to the soundtrack that I think it resembles. I shall leave you to make your own deductions as to why they sound the way they do. Also, a quick note about special effects, which is admittedly a bit nitpicky, but hey, this is what you subscribe for. Some of the effects in this are way too over the top, to the point that I nearly burst out laughing during some scenes. When Buckingham gets beheaded, this giant torrent of blood spurts out and splashes everyone like in a Hammer horror film. How is it travelling at this angle when everyone is standing several feet away from him? I don't know. The fake head they hold up at Anne's execution is just... <laughs> oh dear, I can't stop laughing. Look at it. I know beheading scenes are tricky to do since there are rules in place to stop ITV from decapitating their actors, but you could have just cut away, pardon the pun, and focus on the audience reaction like you did with Catherine's execution. Or do what the film Cromwell did and have it shown from a distance or something, or... Hell, how about cutting away before the final blow like the 1972 film did with their version of Catherine's death, and show Henry's reaction afterwards? The close-up of that mannequin head of Anne with a wig on reminds me of that Blackadder clip. This is the head of a traitor! No, it's not! It's a huge pumpkin! Hell, the one they used for Barry Quinn Scots and Elizabeth R looks more real. How on earth did effects regress after a few decades? The dissolution of the monasteries is also way too dramatic, I mean... <laughs> this is like watching Denethor jumping from the top of Minas Tirith levels funny. Also, I know this was 2003 and all, but the green screen is really bad in this. I mean, really bad. Although I will say it did make Henry and Anne's moat scene that much more surreal and hilarious. How on earth this got an award for special effects is beyond me, although then again it is nearly two decades old, so I can't be too cruel about them I suppose. What I do not understand though is, where on earth did the money go? Remember, the budget for this series was somewhere between 5.2 and 6 million pounds, yet it really does not feel like it. By contrast, the Channel 4 miniseries, Elizabeth, released two years later, had a similar budget of £5.5 .5 million, had noteworthy actors like Helen Mirren and Jeremy Irons, and was also a Tudor drama, albeit one set in the latter part of the 16th century. Yet somehow it managed to remain authentic in nearly every detail. They even went as far as to rebuild a section of the now lost Palace of Whitehall based off of contemporary plans. Even the CGI and other special effects look a lot better, with the execution scene of Mary Queen of Scots being one of the most realistic portrayals of a Tudor execution I have ever seen. Compare that to some of the cheap looking, generic and downright insulting effects, costumes, sets and so on we get to see in this series. Given the troubled pre-production of it though, I do have to wonder how much that alleged 5.2 to 6 million pounds was wasted on script rewrites and battles with higher ups at ITV. Then again, 10 gallons of fake blood must be rather expensive I suppose. Overall then, whilst not the worst Tudor drama we've had to deal with, it was certainly an odd one. You can definitely tell that this is where some of the worst parts of future Tudor dramas were beginning to make their appearance, such as highly inaccurate costumes and set designs, questionable casting choices, and some pretty big deviations from the history. 
Of course, those elements have been in many a drama before then, but this particular one seems to have laid the foundations, which were then expanded upon by series like The Tudors, before we get to the present with the worst Philippa Gregory related dramas that haunt my nightmares. One thing that this miniseries had at least was that they did somewhat stick to the timeline, and now and then some bits were authentic, but a hell of a lot of it was made up for no reason, which I find all the more baffling since this was an era that was already full of drama in the first place. To me, this feels like a missed opportunity. If the series had not had all of the misfortunes beforehand, with struggles to secure budgets and odd executive decisions influencing it, and perhaps had taken their time to cast actors more suited to the role, rather than cramming in star power, along with some script rewrites, then we could have had a somewhat decent drama about Henry VIII. I can't say I hate this one though, since it did give me a few laughs, and as I have said, you could really tell the actors were trying their best, but sadly, it was not quite enough, and this one will forever be remembered as the one with Cockney Henry VIII. Considering what we have in store for us though in the 2020s, with the second season of The Spanish Princess and what could well be an equally awful drama called Becoming Elizabeth, I will probably take Ray Winston's Henry over those options any day. Thank you for listening, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day. Oh, 手が無意識に。